Hi folks! Uh, back again, recording a vlog for the first time in almost a month. Um, because uh, I tried to get all of my vlogs that had to be posted on the Patreon in December up uh, early. And then uh, I had a panel video for the first week in December. And I was sick the second weekend in December. So it's now the third weekend in December, and I'm just now recording my first panel video all month. So, wow. Uh, and it's also my first video for Over the Garden Wall, which so far, I'm liking. I actually watched the first episode uh, ages ago, ages and ages ago when it was new. Um, and I wasn't that enthused with it. I don't remember why. I think probably it was because, uh, Greg is unbelievably annoying in that episode. Um, or I may just have been in a bad mood. I don't know. But, uh, it didn't do it for me at all. This time, uh, the first episode wasn't so bad. Uh, I like the very fairy tale vibe it has because... There's really not a lot of that on TV at the moment. Um, you know, uh, none of the animated series on at the moment really have that kind of classic Brothers Grimm, Germanic fairy tale kind of a vibe to them. Uh, we, we have things recently, relatively recently, uh, that pull from like, Eastern mythologies, uh, you know, uh, Avatar The Last Airbender pulls a lot of influence from Japanese anime, it pulls a lot of influence from Chinese culture, uh, the concept of the Avatar and the cycle of reincarnation is very Hindu, um, you know, but those are all, you know, Southern and Eastern Asian kinds of sources, and, you know, uh, Steven Universe is pulling from a more science fictional pool of references, uh, same with Adventure Time, it's aliens and mutants, and, you know, even the candy people in Adventure Time are played as basically mutants, um, and certainly there's no candy people in fairy tales. Uh, that's more of a, like, 20th century uh, American kind of thing. In fact, I don't even know if there is anything predating the game Candyland uh, that has candy getting up and walking around. That really seems to me like something that would need advertising as we know it, you know, television advertising to have been around for a while before it shows up. Uh, but this is very much, you know, Over the Garden Wall is very much playing with more of a fairy tale register, you know, uh, not just the kind of medieval-ish outfits that uh, uh, the two brothers are wearing, although I do seem to recall in these two episodes, uh, first and second episode, uh, at least one reference to a phone and one to a car. So there's a little bit of, uh, like, are they modern kids or, you know, that have wandered into a fairy tale world or are they, you know, is there anachronism going on? I don't know yet. But, like, the woodsman is pure fairy tale. Uh, the talking bird that tries to give them advice and they ignore it, pure fairy tale. Uh, just being lost in the woods, um, very fairy tale, very, uh, medieval fantasy, like, fantastical tales from the Middle Ages kind of a thing, not, not medieval fantasy in the Tolkien sense. Uh, more in the stuff that inspired Tolkien sense. The... You know, so let's start with the woods, you know. Uh, I don't know if in the 
these vlogs, I know in, uh, no, you know what, I think I have, because I think I talked about them back when Cora went to the swamp. But briefly, I want to talk about liminality, the concept of liminality uh, as it applies to forests, because forests are a classic liminal space. And liminality is this idea of in-between spaces. A liminal space is one that connects other spaces, but isn't somewhere you'd necessarily treat as a destination in itself. It's somewhere you pass through on your adventure. It's neither where you begin nor where you end. And forests, woods are a classic liminal space. And one of the properties of liminal spaces is that it's very easy to become lost in them. It is very easy in stories for a liminal space to connect to anywhere and everywhere. Um, so the woods show up a lot as kind of a metaphor for being in between, for being lost, because it is very easy to get lost in the woods. So, for example, uh, Dante's Inferno starts with him lost in a wood, and then he effectively wanders into hell. Um, that's the liminal space between life and death, and then there's this in-between. Uh, there's the wood between the worlds in uh, Narnia. Uh, I mean, there's tons of examples. Uh, Bilbo Baggins spends basically all of chapter two of The Hobbit uh, wandering through the woods. The woods are what lie between, you know, there's the forest of Mirkwood then again that lies between the middle part of his journey and the end. His journey basically goes home, forest, mountain, forest, destination. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of these sorts of things in fantasy and literature. So they start in the woods. Well, more accurately, we first see them in the woods. They came from somewhere else. And they enter the woods and become lost. Uh, first impressions... He's not as bad in the second episode, but yeah, Greg is spectacularly annoying in the first episode, and I want to strangle him. Uh, he's very, very annoying. Hopefully he will get better. Certainly in the second episode, he's better than in the first. Uh, and I get what they're going with. You know, they're, they're going for another fairy tale thing. Uh, the fool who is too foolish to be afraid. Uh, the Fool is a classic fairy tale stock character. Stock character in a lot of things. Uh, fairy tale is one of them. The Fool is the character who, you know, has a severe lack of wisdom or knowledge. Very often, uh, this means that the Fool will be ridiculously lucky, or they will have access to forms of wisdom that are unavailable to the more conventionally wise. Um, or they will have some kind of superior intuition, or their innocence and purity will turn out to be important and significant. And one form of the fool is the fearless fool. The fool who does not recognize danger and as such cannot be cowed, cannot be intimidated. Um, there's a folk tale that shows up in a variety of uh, European cultures about someone who has to spend the night in a haunted castle or a haunted house, and the fool uh, doesn't realize that they're supposed to be afraid of, you know, the head that comes falling down the chimney into the fire and talks to them, or the ghost that comes out through the wall and tries to scare them. And because they don't know they're supposed to be afraid to any of this, they spend the whole night in the house with no problem and win whatever it is that uh, would be won or break the spell that needs to be broken because they spent the whole night there. Uh, that's pretty clearly what they're going for with Greg. Um, you know, his reaction to the beast is that it or, well, I guess not actually the beast. The uh, turtle-possessed dog uh, is... You have pretty eyes. Uh, 
that's that's pretty clearly what's going on with him. Unfortunately, in the first episode particularly, he's also just really annoying. Uh, Wart, meanwhile, uh, is a bit more of the uh, kind of reluctant hero type. Uh, he has apparently a lost love. Um, I'm guessing that'll be explored more. Or not. It'd be cool if it wasn't. Uh, he, you know, I'm guessing probably that just means some girl rejected him and he's being whiny about it. Uh, that being what most literary lost loves actually were. Uh, you know, and the name is significant there too because Wart in, uh, T.H. White's version of the Arthurian mythos, Wart is what Arthur was called as a little boy. Um, yeah, that's probably the version that's most familiar with, to people because uh, the first volume of White's uh, Once and Future King cycle, which is his version of Arthur, was uh, made into a Disney movie, The Sword in the Stone. Uh, they did not elect to adapt the rest of the series, probably because the next book involves him being drugged and raped by his aunt. Uh, not really a Disney cartoon classic kind of a theme. And it's both a huge part of the book and absolutely necessary to the plot, because that's where Mordred comes from. And... Mordred is the one who ends up bringing about Arthur's demise. So, yeah, they just went with the first book and left it there. Um, that uh, brings us to probably the woodcutter, the third character in of significance in the first episode. Uh, you know, there's... The blue bird who warns them, and they ignore her warning, but... Excuse me. I'll talk about her more when we get to the second episode. Uh, so, the woodcutter, uh, which is Christopher Lloyd, which is awesome. Uh, I love him, and he does a great job at it. Um, he is... You know combination of several stock fairy tale characters. Uh, the old man or old woman who appears on the path and gives them warnings. Um, the woodcutter, uh, probably most famous from uh, uh, Little Red Riding Hood as the one who rescues her uh, from the wolf, but woodcutters show up a lot in fairy tales, um, because there are pe they are people who, in you know, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, would have spent a lot of time alone in the woods because their job was to go out into the woods and cut branches and stuff, and bring them back for wood, uh, firewood mostly. Uh, and he's the miller, um, which is interesting that there's a mill out in the middle of the woods. Um, Mills are important gathering places in, once upon a time because you would bring your, you know, you would, the farmers would have to go to the mill to grind their uh, grain. Uh, people would buy grain and have to go, go to the mill to grind it to make bread. Uh, so it became a place where people gathered. That's why we have the rumor mill, because the mill was a place where people would gather and exchange stories and gossip while they were waiting around for their uh, grain to be to finish grinding. So, rumor mill. Uh, it's a, so it's a great place to pick up stories, and the miller is usually the person who knows everything that's going on everywhere, because they hear all the rumors. Uh, and so those all work combined into one character. And so he provides them with warnings about the beast, who I am assuming will be showing up eventually, uh, or at least 
be pursuing them as some sort of ominous presence. Uh, probably actually show up, though, because this is a cartoon, and you can draw the beast. Uh... So yeah, that's about it. The first episode was basically just an introduction to all these folks. Uh, I enjoyed that the monster was just a dog choking on a uh, black turtle. I, I wonder if that turtle or tortoise, I guess it was a tortoise, I think it looked like it had legs rather than flippers. Uh, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm curious if that tortoise will come back, if we'll ever find out how, like, a little black tortoise transformed a dog into that. I'm enjoying the possibility now that the tortoise is the beast. That would be pretty funny. Um, if, like, in the last episode, they finally encounter the terrible beast, and it's that little tortoise. But it turns out to be, you know, tremendously powerful. Yeah. Um, maybe it's not the tortoise. Maybe it's the candy that did it. Who knows? Um... But yeah, that's about it for the first episode. Second episode, uh, also a lot of fun. I did not know where that one was going. Uh, in fact, because mostly because going in, I started speculating that maybe this would be uh, because of the pumpkins that showed up early on and them stepping in the pumpkins and the pumpkins with teeth in the opening title, uh, open it, whatever it's called, the title screen. Uh, I know what those are called. I'm just blanking on the name for them. Anyway, uh, that this would actually be something that adapted my single favorite piece of folklore ever, Vampire Watermelons and Pumpkins. Uh, apparently it is believed in parts of Romania, or was believed in parts of Romania, I don't know if this is still a story that they tell, uh, that pumpkins are watermelons, if left unharvested too long, uh, specifically if they're still on the vine past Christmas, become vampires. Now, the natural thing to wonder is, they don't have teeth, so how do they get your blood? And the answer is, in my opinion, hilarious. Um, they will roll around and at, and at night, they will come out and roll out of the fields onto the path and try to roll under your feet so you don't see them and step on them and trip. And then, once you're on the ground, a bunch of them will all just start rolling into you, attempting to pound you into mush so they can then roll around in your blood. Gruesome, but... I find it a very funny image. It's this guy on the ground, like, who's tripped, and all of a sudden, watermelons and pumpkins just start rolling into him and bapping into him, and it's just, like, completely ineffectual as he, you know, gets back to his feet, and it's just like, what the hell? So, yes. I am entertained by this possibility. Uh, but no, it actually turned out to be, uh, these weird sort of cult-like, as they put it in the episode, uh, pumpkin people that I guess are, walk are skeletons that wear pumpkins, and they're having a festival, and they have the two brothers help dig up more skeletons for them to become pumpkins. Uh, which means they did actually kind of pass through the world into a land of the dead. Just a very strange and silly land of the dead. Which works. Um, my guess is that a lot of episodes are going to involve them emerging from the woods into some strange, bizarre new place because... Like, I was talking about woods is a liminal space kind of a thing. Uh, maybe not. Maybe they'll get to Adelaide quickly and get some kind of a quest or something. Uh, but I'm guessing not. I'm guessing the search for Adelaide is going to take up most of the series. 
Uh, speaking of Adelaide, um, so Greg rescues uh, the bluebird from the first episode, the talking bluebird from the first episode, Beatrice, from uh, a bush she's caught in, and so now she owes them a favor, which is again a very fairy tale thing. Um, there's lots of stories where the traveler or whatever helps someone that is seemingly not very not powerful. Uh, they help just a random stranger in need. They they help an old woman cross a river, or they rescue a bird that's caught in a bush, or they free a salmon trapped in a net. And the result is that they are rewarded with a companion who can help them, as in this case, or with wishes, or the person gives them some kind of a treasure that proves useful on their journey. So, you know, magical bag or something like that. Um, and so, in this case, Beatrice is going to lead them to Adelaide, who is some kind of a witch or wise woman or something like that, and can help them get home. Uh, and Beatrice is looking for Adelaide herself. Now, I do like that Beatrice clearly just doesn't like them at all, but it feels honor-bound to help them. Um, mostly because that really helps make, like, her complete lack of patience is far more entertaining than... A, it's far more entertaining of a response to Greg's ridiculousness than Wart's kind of long-suffering size. Um, and it makes Greg a lot less obnoxious. Uh, he was a lot less annoying in this episode than in the first one. And I think it's a combination of Beatrice's presence and the fact that they toned him down a little bit. And, and also the fact that now with three protagonists, uh, Greg takes up less time. Uh, he has less dialogue. Um, he's still terrible. Still very annoying. But better. And hopefully we'll continue to get better. Uh, Beatrice is, again, an interesting name. And another Dante reference. Uh, Beatrice was Dante's guide in Paradiso. Um, so it's fitting that Beatrice is the name of their guide now. Uh, it continues to make me wonder about the possibility that they are dead, but I tend to be kind of eh about... <sighs> There's this tendency of doing kind of surface, dark interpretations of children's cartoons, you know, like, oh, they're all really dead, or, uh, oh, what's the really terrible one? Um, oh, that Adventure Time is some kid's, like, dying dream, or, uh, that kind of thing. It's just, it's very unimaginative, very grim, uh, very joyless. Uh, and frankly, most of them really smack of being teenagers attempting to justify still enjoying children's television by trying to make it out to be more mature than it is, which is just completely unnecessary. Just watch kid stuff. Accept it. Enjoy it. You know? The division between adult entertainment and children's entertainment is yet just another one of those things the 19th century made up anyway. Um, you know, just enjoy it. You know, I'm not saying don't enjoy things for adults, too. I'm just saying, like, don't turn things adolescent. That's the worst of both worlds. Uh... So, I don't think they're dead. I, I think they are wandering in a liminal space, which is similar in some ways to being a ghost. Ghosts are trapped in a liminal space between life and death, but it's not the same thing as being a ghost. You're not necessarily dead just because you're lost in a wood. 
but there will be a lot of metaphorical connections to death, and that's all I'm really pointing out. You know, I much prefer going the other way, taking, like, dark, grim entertainment and trying to reinterpret it as being something joyful and childlike. Uh, like, you know, uh... Game of Thrones is just, you know, a high school Dungeons and Dragons game with a really vindictive DM. Um, that kind of thing. Uh, it's, it's more fun. Feel free to comment with your own ideas for that sort of thing. I'm sure there has to be a good one for Battlestar Galactica. I just haven't been able to find it. Um... Anyway, uh, so far I'm enjoying the show. It's, it's pretty solid stuff. There's not a lot of, like, I mean, there's all these fairy tale kind of connections that I'm enjoying a lot, and I'm hoping to see some more of that, and maybe some more stuff to just kind of really get a grip on and start sinking into in the next couple of episodes, which I'm actually going to go and watch right now. So, thanks all. And see you in a few minutes for me. A few hours if you're on uh, the Patreon, and a week if you're on YouTube. Bye!